Alright, so this video is going to be dealing with chapter 16, section 1, which is all about thermochemistry. And thermochemistry is basically about the transfer of energy in chemical reactions, usually measured as heat. And so as a first uh, sort of intro, we're going to be discussing the difference between heat and temperature. So temperature, as we've already studied, is basically the motion of molecules. So if you have these water molecules in this bomb calorimeter that I'll explain later, it's basically a measure of how fast they oscillate back and forth, right? Whereas heat is defined as the transfer of energy. So if you were to, you know, have some sort of fire or some sort of exothermic reaction releasing energy inside this bomb calorimeter, what it would do is that energy would eventually transfer into the water, making these molecules move faster and faster. And then you can measure the total energy transferred, that is how much energy was created in here and then transferred to the water, by how much heat is released. And as a quick clarification, we're going to be using uh, degrees Kelvin for measure of temperature, which basically equal degrees Celsius plus 273 uh, degrees. And heat, we're going to be using kilojoules or calories. Moving on now, we're going to be discussing the concept of specific heat. And before we go into that, we have to discuss the factors that go into how much heat is transferred during a reaction. So the heat transfer depends on three main things. First is the material, and this is where specific heat comes in. For example, it's much harder to heat up water than it is to heat up iron, and that's due to different properties in the two materials, like how iron is a good conductor of heat. Uh, it depends on the mass of material, so for example, it's a lot easier to heat up one gram of water than one kilogram. And the final thing is the total change in temperature. So if you're going to heat something up by 100 Kelvin, it's going to take a lot less energy than if you were to heat it up by one Kelvin. Now this first factor all depends on what is known as the specific heat of the material, which is usually given by Cp. The C meaning that at a constant pressure it has a certain specific heat. And it's defined as the energy required in joules to heat up one gram of material by one degree Kelvin. And for water, that number is 4.18 joules per gram degree Kelvin. Bringing all these factors together now, we get what's known as the heat equation, which basically says that Q, the total energy transferred, is equal to the specific heat of the material times the total mass, M, of the material times the total temperature change, so T. And you'll notice that this is in joules per gram degree Kelvin, this is in grams and this is in kelvins. So you cancel out the grams and the kelvins and you get that the total energy change is in fact in joules. So dimensionally it all makes sense. Moving on now we're going to be discussing what's known as the enthalpy of reaction which basically gives the change in energy, that is the delta H, of a reaction. So it's how much energy the products have stored in them minus how much energy the reactants initially had. So if we look at uh, the combustion of hydrogen in the presence of oxygen down here. Uh, yes, we can see what turns into what, but we don't really know how much energy is produced. And for that, you have to go over here to the product side. And if you've ever seen the reaction of uh, hydrogen in the presence of oxygen, you'll note that it's very violent. It releases a lot of heat, a lot of sound, and a lot of light when you light it on fire, basically. And that is all contributing to this change in energy over here. Now with this complete story, both the chemicals involved as well as how much heat is transferred, we get what is known as a thermochemical equation. In other words, thermo meaning heat or energy, and chemical as in the chemicals involved in the process. It should be noted as well that the energy released over here is completely proportional to how much goes into the reaction. So if you have four moles of hydrogen and two moles of oxygen, in other words, you double how much you put into the reaction, you too have to double uh, the energy output over here. So if you were to react 
four moles of hydrogen in the presence of two moles of oxygen, you'd release 967.2 kilojoules rather than 483.6. Because this releases energy as a product over here, this is what is known as an exothermic reaction. So, if you were to reverse it, in other words, if you were to take two moles of water and add 483.6 kilojoules to the system through electrolysis or what have you, you could decompose it into two moles of hydrogen and a mole of oxygen. And that would then be an endothermic process because it requires energy to take in. Usually, however, you don't give the energy in these blank spaces within the reaction. Normally what you do is you just write the reaction, like I have right here, and then beside it you'll note the change in energy, the delta H in other words. So for this, the change in energy would be negative uh, 483.6 kilojoules because it released those 483, 83.6, and likewise, the delta H for this reaction, the synthesis reaction, the endothermic one, would be a positive 483.6. So exothermic, the delta H is negative, and for endothermic, the delta H is positive. You can think of it basically as how much energy is going into the reaction. So if you put in energy, as in an endothermic reaction, it's going to be positive. If it releases energy or you take out energy, it's going to be negative. So a good way to visualize uh, the difference between exothermic and endothermic reactions is with what is known as a reaction pathway. So here we have an exothermic reaction pathway in which the reactants start with a high amount of energy and then the reaction takes place and they end up with this low amount of energy. And this transfer from reactant to products is the delta H. And as you can see, it has a negative value. If we were to have it so that the pathway went upwards. So up here you could see that here we start with the reactants, here we have the products. The delta H would then be positive and that would be of course an endothermic reaction. Moving on now we're going to be discussing uh, specific enthalpies of reaction. For example the enthalpy of formation is defined as the specific enthalpy of reaction for composition reactions. So when you take the two elements and synthesize some sort of compound, it's the enthalpy change and the zero just means that it's in its standard state. So for at room temperature and one atmosphere, that means that water is a liquid, you know, oxygen is a gas, etc. Now this enthalpy of formation is basically defined as the energy required to synthesize one mole of the material. So why do we measure the enthalpy of formation? It's basically to determine how stable a compound is in its current state. So elements, by definition, you know, oxygen, etc., have a uh, enthalpy of formation of zero because nothing can form uh, an element. So for all of them, they have no enthalpy of formation, essentially. However, some compounds are significantly more stable than the elements that comprise them. For example, carbon dioxide has an enthalpy of formation of negative 393.5 kilojoules. In other words, when you uh, combust carbon in the presence of oxygen to create carbon dioxide, you release this much energy in doing so. Likewise, it would take that much energy to decompose carbon dioxide into its constituent elements. So carbon dioxide is necessarily more stable than its elemental form. And those with positive uh, enthalpies of formation, so when they're greater than zero, tend to be very unstable because they're already above the energy equilibrium. It just takes a small thing to sort of tip them over to the edge into rapid decomposition. Our next special case is enthalpy of combustion, and that is basically defined as the energy released when you ignite some sort of uh, reactant, let's say hydrogen gas, in the presence of excess oxygen. And because you have all this excess, it's hard to determine exactly how much product you create. So the enthalpy of combustion is defined as one mole, or really the energy released, 
by the ignition of one mole of reactant in the presence of all that oxygen. So now we're going to do a practice problem uh, using Hess's law to determine the enthalpy of formation of a compound, in this case the enthalpy of formation of methane from carbon and hydrogen. And there are two main rules you should know. First thing is that if you have all these equations, which uh, involve the various steps involved in creating methane, or using methane in the case of this last combustion equation, uh, if you reverse the direction of the equation, then you also change the sign. So you change from positive to negative, etc. The second thing is you can multiply the coefficients of known equations to fit uh, the steps necessary to determine the enthalpy of formation. So in other words, you see this one half here in front of the oxygen, you can multiply all the coefficients in this equation by two to make that a 102. So the biggest thing in figuring out how to do one of these thermochem equations is getting your products and reactants on the right side. In other words, you see how methane is over here on the left side right now, we need to move it over onto the product side. And we can do that by changing the sign, oh that's originally supposed to be negative, by changing the sign of that negative 890.8 kilojoules to a positive sign and then rewriting the equation. Similarly, because this oxygen is one half, we can multiply all the coefficients by two and simply double this number. So now, having reversed this equation, as is shown down here at the bottom of the red final equation, and multiplied this all through by two, including the energy down here, we can then solve for the desired reaction by canceling out the two sides. So if you see, we have two O2s over here, and we can cross those out with O2 over there on the product side. We have a CO2 over here and a CO2 over here we can eliminate. And finally, we have 2H2O on the left and 2H2O on the right. And from here, it's just a matter of rewriting what we have left in for the desired reaction and adding up the total energy that's over on this side. So the delta H in standard form of formation ends up being negative 74.3 kilojoules for methane.